Hello everybody, uh, I think we are waiting some moments for Catherine to join me. Uh, hello, I'm Ilaria Todde. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a cat to show to you, but I see that Catherine is here. Let's uh, so we are waiting for her to join us. Let's see. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, hello. Hello. And thank you very much, Ilaria, for starting this. Um, there was a little problem with my phone, so I couldn't properly host the conversation. So thanks a lot. Um, so welcome, everyone, um, to another Instagram Live um, by Ilga Europe. You might have already tuned in to conversations my some of my colleagues did um, also on Instagram live so you might have joined Belinda talking to Vuk from ERA on LGBTI rights in the Western Balkans um, or you might have tuned in yesterday when Keenan was talking to Dan from OIA Europe about intersex rights um, across Europe. Um, so I'm very happy that uh, tonight, no sorry, first of all I need to tell you who I am just in case you don't know. Um, so I'm Katrin. My name is Katrin Hugendubel. I'm the Advocacy Director of ILGA Europe. Uh, and I'm really happy that tonight I'll be talking to Ilaria Todde. Ilaria, warm welcome. Thanks for joining me. And thanks for joining everyone who's joining us. I see slowly people coming in. It's really nice to see. Um, so Ilaria is a board member of the Euro Central Asian Lesbian Community, um, the ELC. And in the next... 30 to 40 minutes, we'll be talking about the impact on COVID-19 on the lesbian community across the region. Um, but we also want to take a look at the stagnation we see around family rights being advanced um, across Europe, or better to say, not being advanced at the moment, unfortunately. We want to talk a little bit about lesbophobia, and we want to talk also like why it is really important to look at the intersection of um, gender and sexual orientation as the ELC is doing. DLC has been doing amazing work in, I would say on the one hand, bringing together the community. You've done um, two um, very big and really impressive conferences over the last years, um, but also now online, you're really rethinking how to bring together the community and you, I'm sure you'll say a bit more about that in a second. Um, but I also know that you're working on research at the moment that's on the one hand looking um, into the, the lesbian history, so the movement of the history. Um, it's looking at the capacity on lesbian organizations across the region, but then also about data, kind of looking what's already out there and how to actually analyze the data that's there about lesbian reality. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. And as I said, I'm really happy um, that you join us tonight. So let's dive right into it. Just one little reminder to everybody who's joining us. You can, of course, join that conversation. Um, so if you have a question, just type it in the comments um, and we'll do our best um, in, the, in the course of this conversation to answer um, to our best knowledge. So, Ilaria, looking at COVID-19, um, we're still living under the, the pandemic and ILGA Europe, as well as the ELC, we're continuously looking to assess what's the impact on the, on the current pandemic on the LGBTI community, but also on the movement, on the capacity of LGBTI organizations. What does it actually mean and what does it need to mean for our work? How do we need to adapt what we're doing as ILGA Europe in supporting the community in the movement? Um, but also, how do we need to inform institutions and policymakers to actually take the impact into account? And I know DLC has done the same. You've obviously also looked at, at what the, the pandemic means. So could you say a little bit what DLC's assessment of the impact of COVID-19 is? Um, what, what, how, how is it impacting uh, lesbian women across Europe? Um, and what do you see needs to be done? So hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katrin. Thank you very much, Silvia Europe, for having me here. Um, and uh, so I think I'm very happy, actually, that we can have this conversation because it is actually very important that we, we focus a bit uh, also the discourse of the pandemic on minorities and on structural inequalities because that's, that's exactly what is happening. I, okay. Um, the fact is sorry, that... There was a call coming in. I'm really sorry. <laughs> don't worry, no. I think that we all have to be a bit patient with our technology these days. Uh, no, I was just saying that 
the the impact of the of the of the of the virus uh, on on the work of of uh, of organization and in my you know the work of VLC was mo mostly related to the fact that um, okay it was mostly related to the fact that uh, we we saw immediately an, uh, a problem for the community in the fact that the pandemic was the social distancing was going to make more difficult uh, for the community to 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 be brought together to stay together uh, i see what things happening with Catherine. i hope she will come back soon anyway uh, what he tried to do concerning concerning the um, the, the 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 COVID situation was, as I said, trying to bring it together the community. Was happening. We received a lot of information, um, and I am now alone. Let's see if I can solve this one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Hello, Catherine. You're back. I'm really, really sorry about this. Um, I'm back. I'm here. And I did hear you, actually. I just couldn't follow. So I, I'm sure everybody else could follow really well. And, and I'm sorry about this little hiccup. But um, as I said, I heard what you said. And so please just go on. Um, and yes. I'm here. Yes, of course. So uh, bring together the community was an important part of, of how we try to react immediately to the COVID-19. That meant using also online tools. Uh, we had these uh, daily sessions in which we try to you know, speak with people from lesbian communities around Europe and Central Asia, and there we received a lot of information about the fact that, uh, you know, there was a situation of younger women, younger lesbians being obliged to uh, lock down together with the lesbophobic families, older lesbians being unable to go out, uh, and not having, you know, family that could support them. Uh, we had a situation in which lesbians were fired because they were, they did not have a family, while, of course, their family was not recognized. Uh, I will probably go back to that in a moment. And uh, uh, of course, uh, there, is a, there was a general, a general need to, you know, find the support and find community. So we also focused a lot on mental health and healing and, and, and these kind of things. Uh, and this is, I think, something that will stay in, the, in, the, in these issues is that we, we, we need to really to try to rethink on how we build our communities uh, because they are actually the support system that we have. And uh, because uh, uh, anyway, we need to support each other, especially when we come from this minority position. The other thing that we tried to do was to keep an eye on the situation and try to bring a lesbian perspective. We call them little lesbian genius talks. The, similarly to this live, we had tried to add people uh, which could uh, bring online some lesbian perspective. We did that, uh, for example, on many issues, uh, media activism, uh, some that can just come to my mind, uh, and we had one on, on police violence uh, in response of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, in the US and then, and then in Europe. And we will have one, for example, on lesbian refugee uh, this week on the 20, also following uh, the news from Canada, where uh, you, you probably all have heard that Sarah Ghazi, which was a queer woman and a queer activist uh, committed suicide and she was a, she was a refugee and uh, escaping a very brutal um, uh, oppression in, in, in Egypt. So we, we try to do also that to make sure that lesbian voices stay somehow relevant and stay into this discourse. And then of course there is an issue of support of the movement, the support of the movement uh, because the, the movement is in itself, the lesbian movement is in itself uh, very underfunded in a situation in which it's impossible to have social gatherings, um, gatherings with members, with local supporters, it becomes even more difficult and it becomes even more difficult to provide those fundamental services. So we had a, a grant um, um, program going on and in general I think that a focus on where the money is going, how it is going and how uh, and which kind of organization can access this, 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 this money is quite important uh, for us as an organization and of course I would say also for institutions and stakeholders like funders and, and donors. And then uh, the other things as you mentioned is of course very important for us is data collection. There is very few data, it's oft, often not disaggregated appropriately, experience of lesbian are uh, put together with straight women or with gay men, as it, always as it is, a, as the things are always the same. So we thought to launch also an impact assessment. Uh, I think we will launch it either think next week 
but this is also in the making because we need to try to you know raise awareness on this and and hope that then uh, uh, institution who deals with research professionally will you know continue this work and focus a bit more on on the issue of lesbians Thank you. I, I mean, we, we really see a richness of activity. Um, and, and I think the, the things you're talking about, like the webinars especially, I, I think what's important to keep in mind is that they really serve a double purpose. So on the one hand, it's bringing together the community. It's kind of working against the isolation um, that's kind of inherent in the pandemic at the moment. But it's at the same time, it's making sure that also other um, policymakers, but also allies, um, the general public actually does not forget about the important issues um, around um, that, that actually, you know, are faced by our communities in the times when attention might be shifting mm -hmm. um, to other things uh, in the general agenda. I think one thing you, you picked up in, in these specific problems <laughs> Um, you've seen, and I think that's a, quite a nice link to the second thing we wanted to discuss, um, is family recognition. Um, so under the, the COVID-19, um, lesbian women, but we see it um, in generally um, within the LGBTI community, having additional problems because of their partnerships, because of their families not being recognized. That's impacting on their right to, to move under lockdown measures. That's impacting on discrimination and, and possible violence when they're being stopped in the streets and controlled by the police. So these are things we, we're hearing as well, I think, in, in, in our ILGA Europe assessments. Um, so it's a kind of a nice bridge to turn to the question of family recognition and, and the rights of of rainbow families and, and in that also of lesbian women's, women and turning to the rainbow map. So just for those of you who are, who are listening and who, and who don't know, so the, the rainbow map is an annual benchmarking tool that we as ILGA Europe have. Um, we assess the legal and policy situation in 49 countries across the region. The 14th of May. Um, and, and, identi and, and in that launch, we identified the main trans. And, and one thing we saw very, very clearly across the board this year is stagnation in advancing LGBTI rights. Um, and actually, also even the second year in a row, we saw a backlash. So we saw some countries really taking away rights that were already granted in the past and thus losing points on the map. Um, by the way, you can find, of course, find the Rainbow Euro map. Um, you'll find the link on the ILGA Europe website if someone wants to look into more details. Um, so just to give an example, this year we had 49 countries, so really half of the countries not moving forward on advancing LGBTI rights at all, which is quite uh, an impressive uh, and very worrying number, actually. And one area where the stagnation was really striking was family rights. So the only real advance we saw was marriage equality in Northern Ireland. Um, and then on the other hand, we, for example, saw Serbia um, taking away, like banning medical assisted insemination services for people with what they call a history of same sex relationships. Um, so in the light of that stagnation that we are clearly see family rights, but other also on other areas, what's your assessment of the rainbow map? 2020 what's what's most striking from an ELC perspective well I think you said it well the the, the, the thing that is worrying is a stagnation and backlash uh, because it is showing that these issues are not advancing but when we say are not advancing or we say they're saying they're they're saying uh, they're not moving on it also means that uh, the status quo is, is, is not changing and uh, the, the, there is no um, uh, protection of uh, the rights of uh, the um, mm, and there is no way for I'm sorry there is no way for my, my phone is doing things in the middle I'm, I'm sorry so, so there is no way of, of, of being uh, mm, uh, protected by the law in your in your uh, uh, life and in very important part of your life because when you speak about family we spoke, speak about a really important and fundamental part of life and but aside from the lack of recognition aside from the fact that this is a question of uh, um, discrimination of course because uh, 
uh, what what is happening in Serbia is simply discrimination. There is another way to say to to put it. Uh, aside from that, there is also another issue which is a bit uh, is underlining and it's a bit more specific of uh, lesbian couples and uh, female same sex couple, which is the fact that uh, because they are women. Uh, they are in a socio-economical situation which is generally, normally, more difficult than for uh, men. And this, is happen this happens because of gen structural gender inequality in society. If we think of phenomena such as uh, gender pay gap, uh, uh, pension gap, um, glass ceiling, all these kind of socio-economical phenomena will affect doubly. A, a lesbian couple and will increase the possibility of the lesbian couple to have socioeconomic problem, to uh, be socioeconomically or economically more weak. So in a situation in which you have a completely lack of recognition uh, and you also have this underlining more social economic uh, difficult situation, uh, of course, uh, your life will be more affected by the lack of the recognition. And it will be because it will be more difficult to access to private way of um, protect yourself and protect your family. It will be simply more difficult because it will be more costly for you. And this is something that needs to be kept into, into account. So when we say there is a stagnation, we are saying that the status quo is not changing. And we are saying that, you know, the more vulnerable, vulnerable part of, of, of the community, which means for example, women, uh, will, will suffer more and will have more problems. And, and this is something that should be kept in mind when, when, when we look at the map and we look at this, at this data, we have to remember that this is not just, you know, points yeah. on, 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 a, on, on a very nice map, actually, but they are they actually, they show a very important uh, issue that is not being addressed and that is affecting some part of the community more than others. Yeah, thank, thanks very much. And I think, um, you know, despite the fact that, as I said, there is stagnation, um, obviously there are also conversations going on across Europe and in, in some countries even um, legislative proposals um, kind of to, to advance um, family rights. And I was wondering if we could zoom in there a little bit at the moment. Um, and I think maybe it'd be nice to start to talk a little bit about France maybe, because we do know, and maybe you could say a few words, that there is uh, legislation in process. Maybe you could say how that's going. But also we do know, leading back to the first question, that we do see a COVID-19 impact, and that is that actually the debate has been postponed, and as in, in many other legislative proposals and, and processes across Europe and other areas of LGBTI rights, um, these things have really been put on, on hold, have been put on ice um, in a quite hostile environment. And so kind of, it'd be really nice if you could talk a little bit about what the process at, in France actually is, what the discussions are, but also how the, the discussions and how the fact that these processes have been put on hold is actually affecting the reality of women um, and especially lesbian women in France at the moment. Yeah, the issue with France uh, is that, of course, uh, the high, uh, in France there, there, there was a discussion about the inclusion of, of uh, IVF for access to IVF for lesbian couples uh, since eight years ago. In 2012, there was the um, Mariage pour tous, the Equal Marriage for Everyone uh, discussion in which, at the end of the day, the, the law of equal marriage was approved, but it was approved at the price of eliminating the rights for lesbian to access IVF. And that was eight years ago. Uh, after eight years, we are still in a situation in which this, this issue has not, not been solved. It is not the only country in which this, this situation is there, meaning we have, gender, we have uh, uh, equal marriage, but we don't have access to IVF, for example. Uh, one other example is, for example, Germany. Uh, but in general, uh, the, the issue with France is that this year, in 2020, there was a, a, uh, the, the legislative process started again on a, a legislation concerning IVF for, for lesbian couples. It started, then the COVID crisis hit, and all of a sudden, again, there were more important issues, there were issues who were more uh, uh, relevant, more on, on the page, and, and as you said, this issue was, was put on highs, and there was, there was a, the, the declaration of the majority um, of the member of the parliament to represent the majority in, in France, declaring that they will not, they will not, they won't want to address this issue 
uh, now. And of course, this has to do also with the backlash you were mentioning and the fact that the political debate is very heated and uh, there are uh, some very uh, harsh arguments being made. And, uh, and this is, of course, uh, particularly um, detrimental if you look at it from, from, from the perspective of lesbian women, because here we are speaking about, of course, you know, their, their rights of, of, of people. And there, are, there is a, all this very strong political debate, which becomes often very violent. I'm thinking about, you know, online hate speech. I'm thinking about lesbian activists being harassed because of the, in media, in, uh, uh, online, because they are. And we are, we are, we are hearing from, from our, members in, in, in France that this is happening and this is very uh, worrying somehow and it's also a sign of the fact that you know when you deal with women who take uh, uh, um, who speak up in public uh, you will that there is a, a tendency that to, to also punish them if, if they come and this is of course linked to my misogyny lesbophobia it, it is linked to as I mentioned also before gender inequalities and uh, the big issue of gender that should not be should not should not be forget um, what else? Um, I think that's it for now on, on France, unless uh, you want me to go a bit more specifically. No, it's fine. No, thank you. Thank you very much. I just thought it would be really interesting to give a bit of an insight. Um, and, and thanks for doing that. And um, you touched upon lesbophobia, and we'll, we'll go to that in a second to maybe not make it too, um, you know, too bleak this conversation. Um, there have also been recently very good news from, from Switzerland. Um, and, and I think it'd be nice if if at that moment of the conversation, before we turn to, to another yet heavy tap topic, we talk a little bit also about a, a nice advancement. So could you, could you explain a little bit to people who are listening what's, what's happening in Switzerland and why it matters? Of course. No, yes, of course. That, that's, that's right, actually. <laughs> and you know, we had uh, some very good news uh, recently from Switzerland. Uh, there is a, in Switzerland a debate on the inclusion, the opening of uh, equal marriage and... And that, uh, uh, similarly to France, was linked in the proposal, similarly to France in 2012, I mean, was linked in the proposal with access to IVF for lesbian couples. Uh, also in that case, there was a huge backlash on the legislator to uh, try to eliminate that part of the law. That didn't happen yet, in the sense that uh, the law has passed the first part of the legislative process, has, has gone through the, um, uh, um, the lower chamber of the parliament, will now go for the higher one, so there is, a, there is still some work to do, uh, but yet it's very, very important that these issues are going together and they're not being separated, uh, so also because, I mean, if we, if, if we, if we, if we postpone this issue, uh, people will not, will not have access, it, the things will not happen, and we went, lesbian women will not be able to, uh, to, to enjoy their, their sexual and reproductive rights as straight women do. So it's important that those, those two things are continue to go, to go together, and we are very happy to have seen the advancement in Switzerland. We are very happy for the lesbian activists we know there. And so we hope that this issue will stay like this and will, uh, will, uh, will be approved at the end by the, by the Swiss legislator. Yeah, I think indeed it's, it's, a, it's really a, a big success of tireless effort. And as you said, uh, especially the question around uh, adoption rights and the rights um, of children in, in all of that was a stumbling, stumbling block. We might also remember that there was a referendum that could have actually define marriage as, as um, only between a heterosexual couple in, in 2016, if I remember well. So there were really blocks in the way, and I think that's why we need to, we need to also cherish that moment, even though it's a, it's a stop, step along the way, as you say, and kind of take, take strength um, from that. Um, I just want to send out a little reminder to everyone. So I'm, I'm talking tonight to Ilaria Tode from the Euro Central Asian Lesbian um, Community from the ELC. And if you have any questions um, about this conversation, about the ELC, about the work the ELC is doing, please don't hesitate um, just to let us know in the comments and, and we'll pick it up. So we talked uh, before that it's not only about advancing rights, but very often then in these debates, um, as they become harsh, as there is an opposition standing up against them, um, what you're actually facing and what you're seeing very clearly is, is lesbophobia. And it's kind of that, that mix on uh, homophobia, transphobia, um, together with misogyny and, and really kind of just, just uh, hate against women. Um, 
And so I wanted to, to use that opportunity just to ask you a little bit on kind of, I think in both, in all the legislative advocacy work, but also when assessing the situation of the community of organizations, can you just explain, I probably yet once again, um, why it matters to focus on the intersection between gender and sexual orientation and how this can better understand the phenomena of lesbophobia and of lesbian visibility, or, or rather to say still invisibility. Yes, of course. Um, so the, the thing is that, uh, unfortunately, if we don't focus on the issue of, on the fact that uh, uh, there is an intersection in the experience of, uh, in the life of lesbians, with their gender, uh, sometimes with their gender expression, uh, but in general with the gender, with being or being perceived as, as women in the society, and uh, with the fact that we are, uh, this person who is, who is a woman, who is perceived as a woman, has also a sexual orientation which is non-conforming to the norm, and this thing is an issue because it will always, uh, th these two issues will always go together, but they will interact in a specific way. It's not like they just head up. They are interacting in real ways, and we are seeing that if you don't focus on this issue, this issue will disappear somehow. You will uh, develop women rights, uh, uh, let's say, policies that will conserve straight women, and you will develop LGBTI policy with risk to not take into account the, the, the right of lesbians. So there is a need to try to have a broader perspective. And this is a need which comes also from the issue of, 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 of the fact that this uh, intersection, these intersecting oppression have um, uh, also violent and also very, 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 very strong consequence on the life of, of people. Uh, for, for once, for one simple example, the fact that lesbians in general do not exist in media, that they're very rare, that they are mentioned, etc., etc. But then they do exist in one thing, which is pornography, and I'm here speaking about, of course, an ethical pornography, very much focused on the male gaze and built only for the male, uh, has consequence also on the like lived reality on the streets for lesbians. There was one case which was also included in the report, you, you, national reports that accompanied the, the, the rainbow map, which was, for example, uh, it was a case of uh, violence committed against a couple of lesbians uh, who uh, uh, were on a bus in London, refused to kiss in front of a couple of uh, a group of guys, and they were beaten up for that, for their refusal to, you know, inscribe in this narrative that if lesbians exist, when they exist, they exist only for the pleasure, somehow, of uh, cisgender straight men. This is very problematic and it's, it's very violent and it has impact on, the, on society, but it's always a bit uh, untold. And this has also consequence, for example, on way uh, in which even more violent crimes are, uh, are descriptive and depicted, for example, in media. I am Italian. So there was a case this year which was very striking for me. Uh, there was a, a woman, she was called Elisa Pomarelli, and uh, she, she was murdered by uh, a, a friend of her who was in love with her and she refused him. And she refused him because she was a lesbian. And of course this killing was very shocking for so many reasons, so there was so many problems on the way the media reported the case. But one of the things that happened in this, uh, in this uh, situation is that uh, um, uh, she was, uh, she, the, the media refused to mention her sexual orientation. And why, for example, two weeks, uh, for two weeks they started, they, they you know, made reference of the two of them as a couple for a while, when it was clear that it was actually not a couple, but uh, she was a lesbian. That's changed. They stopped to, refer to make reference to her sexual orientation. Her sexual orientation became Im Im immediately unrelevant. And there is a problem there, which is that if you are not telling the story right, you are actually buying into the narrative and into the same root of the violence. Just to make another example, just to make an example on that, uh, there was one article from a very important Italian newspaper it's called Repubblica. And in this article, the journalist was arguing, was explaining why he didn't want to mention the sexual orientation of the victim. And he was saying that he didn't want to do that uh, because she was only 26. And being only 26, she could not yet be sure. Now, this, this is 
problematic on so many levels. But what I'm trying to say here is that what he's saying is that she, she could still change. And this is exactly the same problem as the case of uh, this murder, of course, the case of corrective rapes and uh, all the other small violence that we hear and we have to witness on the street when there is this kind of, 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 of abuse being performed on, uh, on, on lesbian. And it is, it is therefore very important that we keep this, this in mind. And, you know, it's very important that we have hate crime laws. Again, as an Italian, this is very near to my heart because right now there is a discussion on hate yeah. crime law and uh, on hate crime on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. And this is very important, there is no doubt, and we need that. Uh, but there is also a need to work on how these stories are told, why we are not telling this story correctly, what the media are doing, and then also what are the public policies around that. Uh, why the public policy do not consider this perspective. There is work to do in there, and you can do this work, uh, both on the legislative side, on the media side, and more in general on public policy, only if you somehow keep this, uh, this idea in mind that you should be looking at, the, at, at both issues, the gender issue and the sexual orientation issue, and you will have a clear picture. Then, of course, intersection may be even more than that. We can have lesbians who are trans women, we can have uh, uh, lesbians who are racially died and therefore have uh, the racism, racism will also enter in the discussion, but it is important that we keep this perspective and we don't forget that this issue will influence very much on all the levels, from the per individual one until, of course, the legislative, the, the legislative one. Yeah, thank you. I mean, well, first of all, thank you for sharing this, uh, I think, very, well, tragic, but also very powerful example of, of how 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 things are and and how they still go wrong in so many different ways and actually i mean we are nearing uh 6 30 but it feels like we could open up actually a whole bunch of conversations here from going into hate crime legislation not adequately um including sexual orientation gender identity and sex characteristics but also um really going i mean to one thing you um, you touched upon as well is actually conversion therapies and kind of still that persistent idea that you know people can change should change and and kind of we so we could actually talk about the finally uh growing momentum on 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 legislation that's banning um these kind of practices um but also, I think there's a whole conversation in there, obviously, about intersectionality. And you mentioned before that as, as ELC, you've also organized um, a, a webinar following from the, the protests also in Europe around the Black Lives Matter. Um, and, and there'd be also really a lot to talk about there. And, and unfortunately, um, yeah, I don't know. We don't, we don't really have the time, um, I think, tonight. I don't know if you, if you want to say a little bit about um, that webinar and how you looked at the intersections. And we were talking about the intersection of gender and sexual orientation, but how you also looked at the intersection with, with um, race and ethnicity, so how you actually looked at the, the specific position of um, black women and, and women of color. Um, in the movement. I don't know if you want to add a little bit to that. I think it'd be very interesting at the moment. Uh, yes, we try to, to look at that from the perspective also of um, how to build a um, mm, mm, uh, strategy of resistance. And uh, I, I would not like to, to talk for, 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 you know, black lesbians who intervene in, in the webinar. Uh, in general, we try to, to have a look to the fact that uh, um, uh, lesbians have been uh, dealing with this issue from different perspective. Uh, we had people uh, coming from also Central Asia, where police harassment is very uh, present. Uh, we had also uh, um, people coming from like regional and historic perspective from what happened, for example, in the Stonewall riots. And I think that, that the idea was that we need to build an alliance and to be clear on the fact that uh, there is need for uh, LGBT communities to step up and ally and be very clear on the fact that, I mean, Black Lives Matter, that we need to, uh, uh, to, to, to build solidarity very strongly and to be somehow uh, allies and even complicit with, with this community. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of talking also about healing and how the community heals, because this is, of course, very important. And in general, when you are 
uh, object to that level of st structural oppression, it's, it's very important. And, and of course, it's very important to provide spaces and provide voices. I think that, I mean, I think uh, I, I'm, being white, I, 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 want, I want to be careful on how much I take. I, I speak for, for uh, uh, black people. Uh, but I think that it's, it's, very, it's a very important issue. We should raise more and we should also consider the fact that there are uh, groups of people in our community who are even more invisibilized. There are lesbians that, because they are black, they, they will be even, or people of color, they will be even more invisible. And that needs to be addressed and needs to be, and we, we need to check our own practice all the time about that. So that would be my, my comment, very general on that. Uh, every, anyway, uh, just for the information of the people listening, and uh, we, we have the, the webinar there. I think we are planning to have a second session. And uh, yes, we, we, will, we want to continue to work on this very much because it's, it's fundamental. And it's definitely fundamental. Yeah, thank you. And I'm sure the webinar is also still available um, for it's people who, who want to watch because exactly as we say, it's about providing the spaces and challenging ourselves as well as organizations in how we, how we do provide those spaces rather than us to talking about that. Um, so this is a last reminder and chance for people who want to, to put forward a question. Um, in the meantime, ending on a, on a, you know, yet positive outlook note, um, what makes you hopeful at the moment, Ilaria? Looking at all the work the ELC is doing, looking at the, the state of things in Europe and Central Asia at the moment, what makes you hopeful? Uh, that's a good question, actually, uh, because, of course, the moment is complex uh, for so many different reasons, uh, and it will be probably complex for a while still, in the sense that um, the pandemic might be now under control. No one knows for how long. Uh, no one knows what will happen in the future. Then, of course, there will be uh, economic issues, and, and, and the world will probably change a bit from what has happened, and maybe not just a bit. Uh, and, but I think that what, I, what, what was beautiful for me to see in this uh, very uh, complex time was the fact that uh, you know, we had a lot of coming together, actually. There was a lot of effort to try to keep the people together, even if, you know, in this isolation situation. And there was also kind of an understanding of the fact that this is unprecedented, but the issues that we are seeing uh, are structural. And uh, they, are not, they were there even before, and if we don't address them now, they will be there also after. They will not go anywhere. And uh, that, 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 that awareness, it's actually revolutionary, and this is also what, to, to go back to what we were saying just before, is what we are seeing also with the Black, Black, Black Lives Matters movement. Uh, it, it was part of that, probably, of the fact that we are witnessing unprecedented time, but the issues are, are always the same. They are just more dramatic because the situation is more difficult. And so, but to, to come back to the hope, sorry, I just got a big rant for that. Uh, I think that the fact that we are trying to find new way of resisting, we are trying to change our approach to be more to have more solidarity, to, to try to stay together, it's, it's very powerful for me, it's very beautiful. Uh, I don't know what, what will happen, I really don't know, but this gives give, give me a lot of hope and make me very happy. And also, uh, specifically on the lesbian, because of course this is my focus, uh, I have seen that, you know, and, but, but, that, but this is a priority to, for minorities in general. The fact that being in a minority, you develop skills of resilience, you develop skills of creativeness, you develop skills of try to, you know, react in a in, in particular way to what you are what you are living. And I saw this very 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 powerfully, very powerfully, and very strongly in the in the lesbian community. So I'm particularly proud proud of that. But this also gives me strength and give me, you know. I want to go on <laughs> and to continue thanks to that. So I, let's see. But uh, yeah. Thank you. No, and I think it's, um, I mean, we at ILGA Europe uh, around the COVID-19, we, we, we have what we call our, our package, which is about protect, adapt, and rally. And I think it's exactly that where we would like to work together with, with the ELC, but all, also many, many other organizations on national level, regional level, um, to actually rally forward and to, as you say, kind of, you know, from all the extreme resilience and the, 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 the abilities we've seen, I mean, over the years in the movement to adapt to crisis, to actually 
take it on and to use um, also the, as you say, focused attention at the moment on some structural things that were there before, but weren't really talked about to actually integrate them in the way forward uh, in how we're developing our, our democracy ask, but also our capacity building work, our organizing work um, and all of that. Um, in the meantime, there has been a question. Um, it's very specific about connecting to the LGBTI community in Northern Cyprus. And I would really um, like to suggest that I think both Ilaria and myself will take that forward um, kind of outside that chat. So I think we can, maybe if you can send us a, a, a quick message, um, we, can, we can just answer that in writing and, and, and we can provide contacts, I'm sure. I think that's easier than in this conversation. So if there are no further questions, um, it's uh, yeah, as I said, it was such a rich conversation. So really, thank you very much, Ilaria, for joining um, tonight. Um, it was a bit of a technical challenge for both of us. So um, I'm, I'm really happy that everybody stayed with me um, and, and was patient. Um, but really, thank you very much. And I think there's so many areas we could have gone into in, in much more detail. Um, and so we will continue the conversation um, in this uh, way so on a you know other insta lives that Uga europe might be planning but also in many other spaces um where we're coming together as a movement so thank you all for for tuning in for actually listening to us tonight i i hope it was inspiring i hope you you enjoyed it um thank you very very much ilaria and i'm wishing you all a, a really nice evening thank you thank very you. much Thank you very much, Catherine. And yes, definitely looking forward to continue this conversation together and with other people. Yes, definitely. So yeah, I have to end the, the live, so I will do it. But I'm still not the proper host, but uh, so thank yeah. you all so very much for the technical support. No, 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 no. it's fine. It's, it's, it's improvising, it's fine. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, Catherine. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye.